It's time for the seventh. It's time for the seventh avenue. Why am I keep saying it that way? It's time for the seventh. How do you say it? Seventh Avenue Project. And yes, it is time for the, what is it called? Seventh Avenue Project. Oh yeah, right. The Seventh Avenue Project. I'm your host, Robert Polly. And today on the show... This was a crazy idea. I mean, I knew it was a crazy idea when we formulated it. A physicist who is not afraid to think crazy thoughts, whatever the consequences. For some period of time, uh, my friends would shun me. They wouldn't even say hello to me. Really? No, I'm kidding. I knew that. In fact, far from being shunned, Leonard Susskind is widely admired for his creative and iconoclastic ideas which have helped to open up whole new perspectives in physics. For instance, he's one of the guys who came up with string theory, which is now a major branch of the field. He's also the co-discoverer of the holographic principle. That is the wacky-sounding, but apparently mathematically quite sound, notion that reality can be described as a three-dimensional projection of a two-dimensional film. That, in effect, we are actors in the ultimate 3D movie. And if that offends your sense of logic and reason, well, Leonard Susskind says, deal with it. Sorry, kids, that's out there, and it's become not just a uh, speculation. It has by now become the standard working tool of theoretical physicists in almost every area of physics now. Yes, no matter how lunatic these concepts sound at first, the guy has a pretty good track record, which is not to say that he hasn't also missed the mark from time to time, and fired off a few theoretical duds. Some of them were pretty bad. But right or wrong, he is never boring. Lenny, as his friends know him, is not just a world-class physicist, but also a great explainer. As a professor at Stanford University, he teaches not only aspiring physicists, but also courses for lay people, and they are enormously popular. In fact, videos of those lectures have taken on a life of their own online, logging millions of views on iTunes and YouTube. I first interviewed Leonard Susskind a couple of years ago about his long-running debate with Stephen Hawking on the nature of black holes, a debate that was decided in favor of Leonard Susskind. And you can find that show in our archives at 7thAvenueProject.com. Well, I got back together with Leonard Susskind for another interview in which we focused on his life and career Uh, How a poor kid from the Bronx, who started out figuring he'd be a plumber, just like his dad, ended up plumbing the depths of the universe itself. We're going to hear how he came up with some of his best ideas, and we'll get a very interesting glimpse into the mind of a highly original theoretical physicist. Not something you get every day, so I would strongly recommend you stay tuned. So I'm wondering, uh, now that this is our second time, talking to each other. Can I call you Lenny yet? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Everybody else does. You can call me Leonardo if you like. That's what uh, Richard Feynman called you. Yeah, well, only in Europe, though. Only in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one, one thing that people, um, are, I think, are interested in when they hear your biography is that aside from being a world-class theoretical physicist, you were at one time a plumber. I really was, yes, a real plumber. Do you still get down there? Absolutely and- not. <laughs> First of all, I don't even understand it anymore. Seriously? Yeah. I mean, when I first started as a plumber, there were still lead pipes. You know the word plumber. Plum comes from plumbus. Plumbus means lead. In Latin. Yeah, Uh, yeah, in Latin. And um, the old pipes and old tenement buildings in New York were still lead, and you had to know how to work lead. Today, they're copper and plastic. I wouldn't have the vaguest idea how uh, (laughs) how to do it. Now, you started out helping your dad as a plumber. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, At some point, you obviously made what would seem to a lot of people like a radical leap into physics. What allowed you to make that jump? I started in college in order to learn about engineering so that my father and I could do uh, heating engineering. Mm. The tenement buildings in the Bronx were beginning to, the, the heating systems were beginning to wear out badly. And, uh... My father, Benny, decided it would be smart to go into the business of changing uh, heating systems in the the tenement buildings. And 
he understood and he knew that he didn't know enough. He didn't know enough about uh, how heating systems work. So the idea is I would go to college, CCNY, the poor people's school, learn about um, mechanical engineering, and then we go into business. City College of New York was yeah. was at that time a, a real ladder for a lot of people out of the working it class. It was a real ladder. It was a real ladder in the sense that um, there were plenty of people like myself that came from working class backgrounds, had a reason to want to get educated, but simply could not afford uh, to go to uh, to go to any paying college. Now, of course, at that time, going to Harvard was a lot cheaper than it is now. But I wasn't Harvard material anyway. I couldn't have gotten into Harvard. Uh, I was good at math, and I took some examination, I remember. I did very, very well, and they let me into engineering school at uh, CCNY. I don't know if I had heard of physics. I probably had, but I certainly didn't know it was a thing that a person could do. Um, I knew about Einstein, and I liked mathematics. So when I got into engineering school, I pretty quickly found out that, uh, that engineering was not really what I wanted to do. I wasn't good at it, for one thing. Mm. I, I don't have the, uh, the mind of an engineer. How is the mind of an engineer different from that well, of a physicist? I, okay, I'll give you an example. You stick a tinker toy in front of an engineer. If he's a good engineer, he'll build something interesting. <laughs> if you stick a tinker toy in front of me, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> now, if you, on the other hand, make something that's, that works and does something a little bit anti-intuitive, for example, if you give it to me, I can figure out how it works. But I wasn't built for engineering. My mind was just not focused on it. Uh, mm. And um, one way or another, I wound up talking to a physics professor, and the physics professor said, yeah, you can be a physicist. I didn't really know what it was. I would say within weeks of the time that I started to study physics, I became really interested in it. I was hooked. I knew what I wanted to be, and I knew that I was not going to be an engineer. Mm. I knew that I was not going to be working with my father. How did he take the news? When I told him I wanted to be a physicist, his reaction was, you're not going to work in any old any drugstore. He thought I wanted to be a pharmacist. <laughs> I told him, no, a physicist, that's like Einstein. And the minute he heard Einstein, he was hooked. He, he uh, said, are you any good at it? And I said, yes. He said, okay, you're going to be Einstein. Mm. So, you know, that's a story I've told many, many times. But the fact was that my father did have an intellectual bent. He was a curious man. And um, I think maybe secretly he was relieved and um, very satisfied that I wanted to be a scientist. What did he think when you made it in your profession? He tried to follow. He tried to learn some physics. He tried to learn some mathematics and some physics. But it was very frustrating for him. He as I said, he had a fifth grade education. He knew seat of the pants science. He knew right triangles. He knew A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Why? Because when you run a pipe at a funny angle across a room, you have to know how to compute the length of the hypotenuse. So he knew that. But um, it didn't extend terribly much deeper than that. So when he tried to learn about it, he got frustrated. Uh, I never asked him, look, Dad, hey, I never called him Dad. I looked, Benny, are you proud of me? But I'm sure he was. Oh. Yeah. His hunger to know about it, was that part of your inspiration for um, what has become almost like a second career for you beyond contributing to theoretical physics? You've become quite a teacher of ordinary people through Stanford continuing education classes that are now super popular online and through your popular books. Yeah, I, I wondered uh, from time to time, do I get particular satisfaction out of it because I'm doing something? Uh, I'm, not, I'm clearly not teaching my father. He's dead. But, uh, but doing what I might have been doing if I was teaching him, maybe. On the other hand, I know my own mind. I enjoy, not just enjoy, I get a lot of benefit out of out of explaining things. It's one of the ways I think. I always, when I'm thinking about physics, I always have in the back of my head an imaginary audience that I'm explaining it to. 
even when you're coming up with the initial idea? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a pattern. I'm always imagining explaining things. That is and, tr- uh, completely fascinating to me. You know, I would have imagined a process in which you work at the um, frontier of thought with intense mathematics and abstractions that the majority of us couldn't even get close to, and that you might then, in an act of noblesse oblige, come <laughs> No, 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 no noblesse oblige. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, not at all. That's fascinating. Oh, no, not at all. Look, I didn't start doing this out of a sense of obligation to anybody other than myself. I get a kick out of it. I like the people. They serve my purpose. My purpose is to have an audience, <laughs> an audience to explain things. I serve their purpose as somebody who can explain physics to them. Uh, I didn't come at it with uh, the social uh, obligation to teach science to people. No, right. no. Um, your friend Richard Feynman said, and I know this because you've told this story, that if you can't explain something simply, then maybe you don't fully understand it yourself. Yeah, I, I, I pretty much believe that. He did say that. Um, I think I knew it anyway, but I think it's very, very true that if you can't explain something, perhaps, you know, I, I think he said if you can't explain it to your grandmother or something, but he didn't really mean that. Um, if you can't explain it, at a level which is much, much simpler than uh, than the f- fancy mathematics you're using, more intuitive, then it's very, very likely that you don't completely understand it. Now, what he meant by not completely understanding it, I think, is that perhaps nobody completely understands it. He had a very, very deep understanding of uh, of things and was able to explain things simply. And I think when he said... If you can't, I think he meant if he can't, if he can't explain, uh, let me put it in his words or as if he was saying it. If I can't explain something, I don't understand it. Mm. And I do believe that. So do you think that's why the process you just described happens the way it does, which is even in the initial moment of insight, you're already interpreting it? Yeah, yeah. uh, For others, I mean. Yes, I think even... As I'm thinking about it, uh, formulating the thing, I am in my head explaining it, and um, that certainly makes uh, m- makes it uh, ready to be explained. Mm. I think. On the other hand, I think there would there would probably be people who would say, "It is, yes, it is my strength as a physicist, but it's also my weakness." How so? Um, I'm not enormously good at explaining things in a deeply technical way. Uh, In many ways, my way of working is intuitive. It uh, is less mathematically, technically sophisticated than a lot of uh, my colleagues. And um, it's probably my weakness that I can't... It's not that I can't that I, I really just don't think in a, in a highly technical, mathematical way. Of course, I, to say that, I do think mathematically. We all do, meaning all uh, theoretical physicists. Me, probably less so than many. I don't think in terms of symbolic equations. I don't think in terms of, um, of mathematical structures. I think in terms of pictures. And I think in terms of, um, of simple explanations. So it's both a strength and a weakness. You know, um, when I last interviewed you, maybe four years ago, in your house, as we are now, you took me upstairs to your office. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe the first time I've been in the office of a very famous theoretical (laughs) physicist. And I might have expected a very fancy computer and maybe some other equipment. Instead, I found an old model PC. Yeah and some paper on which you were scratching pictures, Feynman diagrams. Yeah. Uh, these are these simple-looking diagrams yeah. invented by Richard Feynman. Absolutely. And you told me you used the computer mostly for graphical purposes, too, I think you said. Okay. Um, I use the computer for email. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't do Facebook. <laughs> I had a Facebook account that my son set up, but I, I got so annoyed by it that I just shut it off. 
I use the computer for looking up things regularly, you know, if I want to know um, uh, what a word means or how to use it. Uh, and I use the computer to write papers. I type. I finally learned right. to type at the age of 53. That was a long time ago, <laughs> 20 years ago. Uh, I learned to type. And so I type my own papers now, which we've been doing for a long time. Um, one of the things I always enjoyed as a kid was coloring books. And when I discovered Microsoft Paint, I started drawing all kinds of pictures, and I realized that it was very good for drawing the simple kinds of diagrams that I use when I write a paper. Exactly. That's what you showed right. me. Yeah. Right. So I do, and I often draw diagrams for papers on Microsoft Paint, and for me it's a sort of combination of doing what I have to do and uh, the coloring book mentality. Right, and and so I, that that really struck me um, that you, your tools were very simple and that they were largely visual. Yeah. Um, so let's take an example of one of your insights, one of your most famous. You are regarded as one of the founders of string theory. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can explain for our audience, you know, on a simple level, what string theory is, and then maybe you can tell Ooh. me about some of your initial. Ooh, that's unfair. <laughs> Okay. You said you weren't going to do that. <laughs> no, no. When Once you said you think of everything in terms of an explanation from the get-go, yeah. I thought, okay, let's throw one at him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do a simple thing. Can you remember those initial um, eureka moments when you first came up with this idea of these oh, vibrating yeah. strings oh, of yeah. energy? Oh, yes, I certainly can. Okay. Um, a friend, he wasn't a friend of mine. He was a friend of my friend Yakir's. Uh, he came to visit our institution at the time in New York, and he was incredibly excited. His name was Hector Rubinstein, and he was incredibly excited about some work that a young Italian physicist had done. The young Italian physicist was named Gabriele Veneziano, a very famous man now. At that time, he wasn't so famous. This was 1968, I think. And he had this formula, which he wrote on the blackboard, I didn't know what it meant. I couldn't even figure out what the symbols were. But the formula was on the blackboard. It was a formula having to do with elementary particles, collisions of elementary particles. And um, I looked at the formula, and after about 15 or 20 minutes, I realized it was pretty simple. And it struck a chord. It, uh, I, I couldn't figure out what it was, but I knew, I knew that this formula, incidentally, the creation of the formula had nothing to do with a picture of strings. It was just a mathematical representation that was supposed to represent some data, uh, a formula which fits some data. And I looked at it, and I eventually realized this has something to do with what physicists call harmonic oscillators. Harmonic oscillators is anything that vibrates, a tuning fork, a spring, uh, a molecule, an oscillating molecule, oscillating means going back and forth, and or vibrating. And I realized that the that the symbols were very very similar to the symbols that governed vibrations, uh, vibrations of what I didn't know. All of the other people working on this were just working on the formula as an abstract mathematical formula. I looked at it and I said, look, there's something going on that's vibrating in this thing. It has all of the features of uh, the formulas for vibrating tuning forks or whatever. And I thought and I thought and I kept trying to put it together so that the formula would come out the same as Veneziano's. It took months. It took about two months. And one day I was sitting in my uh, attic in Teaneck, New Jersey, and all of a sudden, I don't, you know, it's one of these things that you really can't put your finger on. What exactly stimulated the idea? It was a number of things that came together, and I realized it wasn't a simple spring. It was as if a whole bunch of springs had been connected together to form a string of springs. A whole bunch of springs connected together, one after the other, so like a slinky toy, and uh, there were things in the mathematics which said that, but there was also a picture in my head that was developing in that, along that direction, and I suddenly realized that the mathematics fit together with the picture. 
And uh, yeah, it was a very exciting moment for me when I suddenly realized something that I thought nobody else knew. And and this was a model of interactions between particles. It was a model of, first of all, it was a model of particles themselves. Oh, I see. Particles were little oscillating things uh -huh. that vibrate. Little oscillating uh, things that could be represented almost as rubber bands. I called them rubber bands. I was not the one who invented the term string. I don't know who it was. I used the term rubber band. Uh -huh. Right. Well, of course, a rubber band is a string, but... Uh, <laughs> but I, I can't imagine um, right. a huge number of physicists all specializing in rubber band theory. String theory just sounds better. Yeah, yeah. String theory sounds better. <laughs> right. Rubber band theory was not a big hit. Now, you, you demurred when I asked you to explain string theory, but the, here's the... But then the, I did. Well, you sort of did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the way it's usually presented to us groundlings, mm -hmm. that on a very tiny scale much smaller than actual elementary particles, much yes. smaller than quarks, right. uh, are these vibrating strings of energy. Right. And if you model particles in this way, you can explain things that you couldn't explain otherwise. That's correct. For instance, the big problem of quantum gravity, what gravity does at a quantum level. Right. Now, that's not at all obvious what the connection between gravity and strings is. Yeah. And I fear to tell you that this is one of these things that I cannot explain to you, which probably means I and we <laughs> don't completely understand it. But um, nevertheless, when the interactions between these strings were worked out, the forces between them, it turned out to everybody's horror, in a sense at the time, that the forces looked exactly like the forces of gravity, we weren't trying to describe gravity. We were trying to describe protons and neutrons and mesons. And all of a sudden, what was coming out of the equations was gravitational forces. This was something that we actually didn't want at the time. We didn't want to be describing gravity. We wanted to be describing the interactions between protons, neutrons, mesons, and, uh, and other subnuclear particles. The strong interactions? The strong interactions. What was unexplained at that time that, ne that Everything. required? Oh, really? Everything was oh. unexplained. Nobody knew what protons and neutrons were. At that time, that was before people really understood quarks and what holds them together. I see. So you were yeah. modeling that whole field of, is it quantum chromodynamics? It's what is now called quantum chromodynamics. What holds quarks together? What holds quarks together is something like strings, strings of gloop. Glue. <laughs> strings of gluons. Now, these are not the same yeah. strings that are now being talked about as super the, the, strings. Well, they're mathematically the same, the same. strings. Okay. Yeah. There's no question that, um, that the subnuclear particles like protons, neutrons, mesons are fundamentally string-like. But the actual mathematics we were using at the time, that I was using at the time, was more appropriate to another domain of physics, another world of physics, the world of gravity which is the world of things very, very much smaller than protons and neutrons, many, many orders of magnitude smaller. That may surprise you. You'll think that gravity has to do with big things. Yeah. Yes, that's true. But gravity also has to do with the super, super duper microscopic world. Uh, only gravitational forces are strong enough to bind things at the tiny, tiny distance that, uh, that elementary particles might exist at. So it was something of a shock to discover that the equations looked more like the theory of gravity than they did like the theory of protons and neutrons. I actually knew that, but I was not the one who pointed it out. I was horrified by it. I didn't like it. I didn't mm. want that to be the case. Mm. It was... Um, uh, John Schwartz and uh, a physicist, physicist, a French physicist by the name of Joel Shirk, and another physicist in Japan named uh, Tamiyaki Yonea, who are the ones who pointed out, look, this looks like gravity. Wow. And that realization has fueled the explosion in, in string That is theory. certainly what fueled it, absolutely. Um, going back to that moment of inspiration of yours, when you were looking at these equations or this data yeah. uh, that were well, being it was, it was equations. Equations. I've never looked at data, real data in my life. But it was meant to represent data. Yeah. Um, 
and you started to get a little intuition that this looked like an oscillating system, and mm-hmm. you went back to the the mm-hmm. attic and <laughs> right. to the lab and thought about it for 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 months. Um, do you think maybe the fact that, as you said earlier, that you aren't a super technical mathematician made you somehow more able to spot a big pattern in that? That's possible. Uh-huh. That is possible. I think maybe it's true. But um, I, I, it's not that I'm not good at mathematics. Well, I didn't mean I to imply be. that. No, 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 I can be. <laughs> it's just not my natural mode of thought. And um, I think in that particular case, yes, that my particular way of thinking was the right way to think about that. Uh, incidentally, it was not quickly accepted by the community doing this kind of work, uh, the string idea. They wanted the mathematical equations. They didn't want the picture. It didn't take long. You know, it took a matter of a year or so for people to say, oh, yes, well, they really are strings. But they didn't want to hear about rubber bands. Not at first. (laughs) Not at first. Not at first, no. Wow. Uh, And just for um, audience members who may not have followed that bit about quantum gravity, this is like a huge problem in uniting uh, various domains in physics. Right. That... General relativity, Einstein's description of gravity, didn't seem to work at really small scales. That's correct. Um, Peculiarly enough, in quantum mechanics, gravity becomes very, very strong at extremely small distances, much stronger than the other forces. The other forces, electromagnetism, other kinds of forces in nature... Gravity becomes the most dominant one when you get to extra- extraordinarily small distances, uh, so when things are separated by tiny, tiny, super microscopic distances. Gravity just becomes very, very powerful and um, became so powerful that it sort of overwhelmed itself, mathematically just uh, became too powerful, too strong, and just led to mathematical disasters. <laughs> it went to infinity, right? It went to infinity. Mm-hmm. It just became infinitely strong and uh, overwhelmed any sense of uh, what it should be doing. So uh, the theory of gravity, when it was combined with quantum mechanics, was a disaster. Everything came out infinite. Everything came out wrong. And string theory offered a resolution of that. Strings were not infinitely small. They never got close close enough together for this monstrous uh, infinity to happen. So string theory became a solution, a potential solution for the puzzles of how to put gravity and quantum mechanics together. There's still plenty of debate about whether uh, string theory is a correct theory of nature. We don't know. But what we do know is that it's a mathematically uh, consistent description of gravity and quantum mechanics. Mm. And that makes it extremely interesting. Of all the ideas you had, and I understand that you had quite a few, is that your favorite? Gee, I don't know. It's like asking you, uh, which, which is my favorite <laughs> child? I well, mean, let's talk know. about some of your other kids then. All right. Tell me some others. Well, there was the holographic principle, which... Good. Uh, I wanted to get to that of, one. Yeah. Okay. You, but it grew out of thinking about things about strings. Uh, but oh, it many, did. Many, there were many, many... I have many children. What's, I have many children. I'm not sure which one is my favorite. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the holographic principle because this came up in our last interview. Yeah. And I have people to this day tell me that they really enjoyed the interview but that holographic principle. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I don't get that. <laughs> Sorry, kids. That's out there, and it's become not just a uh, speculation. It has by now become the standard working tool of theoretical physicists in almost every area of physics now. All right. Well, I'm not going to let you duck out of this one. You have All to right. give us a, a capsule explanation. Of the holographic principle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it originated for me and for Gerard Hithoft, who was the other co-inventor of it. The great Dutch physicist. The great Dutch physicist. Realizing that you could never squeeze anything down to a smaller size than a black hole of of, of a given mass. You can never take a mass and squeeze it down to a smaller distance than the size of a black hole. That meant that if you took anything in the world in some region of space... Let's put it into a, into a uh, spherical 
region. It could be anything that you could think about. Letters of the alphabet uh, made out of, uh, what, what is it, alphabet soup, cheese, um, <laughs> uh, uh, nails and bolts and whatever. You, you, you put it in there, and there's a certain amount of information, a certain amount of entropy, a certain number of degrees of freedom, we call them, a certain number that we are required to describe the system. Now you build a black hole around it. You can build a black hole around things. Not so easy, but uh, you can collapse a star around them. You can collapse a shell of material around them, and you make a black hole out of it. Everything that's in there is inside the black hole in a sense, but we knew that the black hole had a certain number of bits of information in it. What you hid behind the black hole could not have had more than was in the black hole because it, it is in the black hole. So the conclusion was that there can't be more information in the system than in a black hole of the same size. But we knew the amount of information in a black hole of a given size was proportional to the area of its horizon. Not its volume, but its area of its horizon. The horizon being the shell outside of the, the black hole. The shell outside the black hole. Yeah, a sphere. So there we were. Everything in the world can be described in terms of a number of units, a number of elementary units, which are no, no bigger than the area of the boundary of the region they're contained in. Well, that has a very great similarity with holograms. Holograms are two-dimensional surfaces. They're films. They're films, two-dimensional surfaces, which you can make an image of a three-dimensional thing inside the hologram. So it had the feel of saying that everything in a region of space can be thought of as a kind of hologram that's coded on a thin film at the boundary of the region. In other words, the world is really two-dimensional. It's not really that. But the world can be described by a everything that goes on on a two-dimensional boundary far, far from... Uh, you know, we're surrounded by a shell that's called the horizon. Not the horizon of a black hole. The horizon of the universe. The cosmic horizon. The cosmic horizon. The cosmic horizon is like a giant shell out there uh, that's uh, 20 billion light years in radius. And what this was saying is that everything that takes place in the universe could be described as if it were a hologram on the boundary of that, on that very, very distant um, horizon. This was a crazy idea. I mean, I knew it was a crazy idea when we formulated it. I also knew it was right, hmm. but I knew it was a crazy idea, and it was regarded as crazy. For some period of time, uh, my friends would shun me. To, they wouldn't even say hello to me. No, I'm kidding. But then it became, it very shortly became standard uh, physics, largely through the work of a young Argentinian physicist named Juan Maldacena who does have the skill to do fancy mathematics. And he put it together into a very, very precise form, a very exact and precise form, that, uh, namely that the world is a hologram and that us, the real things, the things we normally think about, are almost like the image cast by the hologram. Mm -hmm. Let's back up and take it. Step by step. So you and Gerard yeah. Tuft were thinking about black holes. We were thinking about black holes, and we were thinking about the, um, the horizon of the black hole and the fact that the horizon had to describe everything that was in the inside of the black hole. Right, so this two-dimensional shell. Right. two-dimensional shell on the outside of the black hole had to be capable of describing and keeping track of everything on the interior of the black hole. And by the way, I think um, for listeners who really want to dig into details, um, they can go to our earlier interview about black holes where we talked about this very phenomenon. Yeah. So you had this idea that a sheet of, of information could actually That's describe... Right. A sheet of information on the surface of the black hole and the boundary of the black hole, the so-called horizon, was 
a precise description, a precise mathematical description of everything that takes place inside the black hole. Mm. Very, very much, very, very much like a hologram is a film, a thin film, which keeps track of a whole three-dimensional world. Right. You, you so, can make a hologram using lasers in which you encode on a sheet of something similar to photographic film. It is photographic film. Photographic film. Uh, photographic Three-dimensional di- three information so that when you then project that information, you can create the illusion of three-dimensional objects. Right. A lot of us have seen that. Right. And if you were to make a movie out of it, you could create a hologram, a three-dimensional hologram, which moved around and uh, you know was, looked like the real world. In fact, it would be a lot better than 3D films are now. Yeah, you could <laughs> uh, walk around it and look at it from the side. and yeah. uh, right, It would be a lot better. Um, it's kind of interesting. If you look at that film, the actual piece of film, and you look at it under a microscope, you would see no evidence at all of the three-dimensional figures that it was uh, describing. What you would see is a bunch of random noise. Noise means random stuff. Little tiny spots and streaks and uh, microscopic. Just random, uh, you know, like a kid taking a pen and uh, and making random marks Mm -hmm. on a piece of paper. And yet, those random marks, when assembled or reassembled in the right way, create a coherent three-dimensional image of something. That's what was going on in the black hole. The horizon was behaving like the film. Random scrambled information, which in some way is keeping track of uh, the coherent things that fall into the black hole. That's not just a theme about black holes anymore. It has turned out to be a very, very powerful tool that has extended not just the theories of gravity, but all kinds of things, including superconductors, things in the laboratory. So um, this idea, which was pretty crazy, has now matured into something which is standard. It's, it's standard, it's common, it's not even considered exciting anymore. I want to ask you about that, but I want to recap just a tiny bit more. Um, so you took this idea that you had already applied to the black hole horizon Mm -hmm. and thought further and thought, you know, you could use the same principle to describe the whole three-dimensional universe inside the cosmic horizon. That's right. By the way, the cosmic horizon is the point, as the the word horizon suggests, beyond which we can't see. That's right. Because beyond that, over that space, things are receding too fast for light to reach us. Right. The universe is expanding. The further out you go, the faster it's moving away from us. And if you go out far enough, it's moving away with the speed of light. So the light rays are running away from us, and we can't see beyond that point. That's called the horizon. Right. So you could mathematically assert that, gee, there could be this film, like a hologram, out at the, the cosmic horizon, into which is projected all the contents of the universe, including you and me. Right. Horror. Okay, now this sounds, again, like you've been smoking something. Yep. Um, my question, though, uh, and I, I asked you this before, but I'm going to ask no, you... No, no, at the time, you know, at the time, <laughs> we knew it was right. Right that it could be mathematically true. Yeah. But, but you know, is that the same as saying it's really true? And, and why would you want to say it's true? What, what does that buy you? What it bought us is a way out of a uh, out of a crazy dilemma about black holes, and it brought us out of crazy dilemmas about the quantum theory of gravity. Ah, it suddenly unraveled for us that the quantum theory of gravity was very, very different than we thought. This all has to do, first of all, with quantum mechanics and gravity combined together, and um, it uh, opened up the way to a much, much deeper quantum theory of gravity. The quantum theory of gravity is holographic. So the current understanding of gravity and quantum mechanics, which is far more advanced than it was before this idea, was a consequence of it. So that's one thing, gravity and quantum mechanics fitting together. But I, you know, um, I don't like using the word really or reality, or uh, when talking about physics. What is real? Is the hologram real? Is the thing, in, is the, thing the picture of it real? Um, we make up mathematical rules 
rules which work. They work, they describe what they're supposed to describe, they describe the experiments which are done, they are accurate, and those are the facts. Everything else is in the mind. And when somebody says, is it really like that, or is, it, uh, or is that real, is this real, or is that real, there is no answer to it. But let's um, try to avoid, I think, a literal interpretation here that people could jump to, which is that if we were to travel, how far is it to the cosmic horizon? 20? No, 20 billion light 20 years. billion light years, roughly. Something like that. If we were to travel out there, we'd find this actual shell of a film. Yeah, no, we wouldn't. No, we would not find an actual shell. <laughs> and in fact, of course, the cosmic horizon is, is, is relative to your location. Right. It will move away from you <laughs> as right. you move. It's exactly like the horizon on the Earth. As you walk around on the Earth, uh, you're always surrounded by the horizon. You can never get to it. Exactly. So what are right. we saying when we say that there is this three-dimensional projection inside of a two-dimensional uh, representation? What it says is that the mathematical description of reality has fewer degrees of freedom, fewer possibilities than we would have thought if, uh, if we thought that the world was a volume world instead of a surface area world. There are fewer ways of reorganizing matter than we thought. Why is that? Because it turns out almost everything, every way that you could reorganize a collection of particles and so forth would turn them into a black hole. Uh -huh. And so there are many, many fewer um, variations on the way a region of space can behave than we thought. How many fewer? Basically the number of variations that you can have on a surface. So That's it's a mathematical fact. And I, I, I don't think people should say, does that mean we are really on a <laughs> film out there? We don't even really know what it means yet. What it means philosophically, we don't know. Right. Uh, but I think you, you did a nice job there of explaining why it's useful, because it establishes certain constraints that explain things like quantum gravity, you're saying? Help explain? Yes, yes. It so, provides the first real quantum theories of gravity. So I can anticipate a question that might be popping up in some well-informed listeners' minds, which is, wait, we heard that string theory actually tells us that there may be 10 spatial dimensions, you know? Yeah. A lot more than three. Yeah. And you're telling us that there really <laughs> are two. Yeah. Right. Um... Boy, you got me caught, don't you? <laughs> are there right. different dimensions at different scales? What is it? Yeah, there are different dimensions at different scales. Okay. Yeah, but these other dimensions are always very tiny. Right. And we're talking now about um, how much would it take to describe a large region of ordinary space. Hidden in that ordinary space are tiny dimensions that are too small to see, but they're just part of the... Uh, of the world of three of three dimensions, right, right. So, uh, yeah, no, this is uh, this is uh, this is true. That, and the microscopic level, not thinking about the very big world, if we could get down with a microscope to see things on sufficiently small sizes, we would discover additional dimensions, hmm. and, and that is what string theory says. But it goes back before string theory. It was not an invention of the string theorists. It went back to 1917, very, very shortly after Einstein discovered the special, the general theory of relativity, that a gentleman by the name of Kaluza started thinking about what would happen if the world had more dimensions than we can actually see. Why can't we see them? Because they're too small. Mm -hmm. But he realized that you could explain not only what Einstein which was explaining, which was gravity, but you could also s explain electricity, magnetism, and maybe other things. So um, the whole idea of extra dimensions is a very old one and is part of every theory of elementary particles going way back. Hmm. Uh, we talked about your initial education in mm -hmm. physics starting at City College mm -hmm. and then continuing at Cornell, is that right? Yeah, continuing at Cornell. So when did you go from being a person who was just learning physics to one who started really having, you know, bold new ideas? Too early. <laughs> Too early. Before I knew enough physics. 
before I knew enough physics, I was often making theories. Some of them were pretty bad. <laughs> Can you remember some? <laughs> Not really. Come on, um, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had a theory of a photon, which was based on Maxwell's equations. Maxwell equations are the equations of electricity and magnetism and light, photon, of course, being light. And um, the equations were correct. The equations were quite correct, but I completely misinterpreted them. They looked too much like the Dirac equation. The Dirac equation is the equation for an electron. And so I tried to interpret them the same way that Dirac interpreted his equations and uh, found out to my chagrin later that, uh, that the photon was a boson and not a fermion the electron is a fermion. Don't worry about what all of that means. Different all I'm telling you particle. is that I didn't know enough right. to be making theories at that right. time, or at least that theory. Well, I've always thought that you know to be a really good theoretical physicist, you probably have to have a lot of chutzpah. Because yeah, a guy like me, well, you know. I look at it and I think, who am I to even begin to add to or change this amazing you know structure that yeah. brilliant minds have put together? Whereas I'm thinking a guy like you says... Yeah. Get out of my way! I'm going to start. I, I think that's up. right. I, I think that's right. I think um, the physicists that I know are fearless in that way. They don't even think about the fact that they're deeply upsetting what their fathers and grandfathers and their great grandfathers put in place uh, fifty, a hundred, two hundred years ago. They are completely oblivious to the fact that they are wrecking whole structures <laughs> and. Uh, and that Einstein would be appalled. Um, you know, a lot of theoreticians talk about being guided in some way by a sense of beauty. You know, this looks ugly, therefore it probably isn't right. This looks beautiful, therefore it must be right. On the other hand, you've got to be willing to break beautiful things too, right? You have to be willing to break beautiful things, yeah. Look, quantum mechanics broke uh, classical mechanics. Classical mechanics which is just the theory of the non-quantum mechanical world, is an enormously beautiful, elegant mathematical structure. It was created by the French mathematicians, and if anybody knows about elegance, it's the French, <laughs> especially the French mathematicians, uh, uh, with a little bit of help from, uh, from uh, Hamilton, a Scottish uh, a mathematician, a lot of help, I should say. Yeah. Um, yeah, classical mechanics was an absolutely elegant uh, framework for studying physics. It just, in the final analysis, turns out to be the wrong framework. At least it's not a complete framework. Quantum mechanics came and just busted it, just tore it to pieces. I suppose scientists in general, maybe maybe any creative people in general, Breakers of the traditions, yeah. So, so what is that sense of beauty, you know, of aesthetics? What role does it play in your thinking? Well, what, what is a physicist? What does a, a physicist or a mathematician mean by beautiful? Yeah. You have to think about what does that mean? Well, what they usually mean by it is, first of all, that it is minimal. You, ha you don't use more assumptions than you need. That the whole description of a phenomenon can be written on a, on a, in a small little box on a page. Maxwell's equations described a great many phenomena, electricity, magnetism, light, x-rays, uh, gamma rays, radio, radio waves, waves yeah. all of that stuff, many, many different phenomena, all with the same set of equations that you can write on a two-inch by two-inch uh, sticky pad. Oh, a post-it. On a post-it, <laughs> right. That is, as far as I can tell, pretty much what physicists mean or mathematicians mm. also mean by elegant, minimal, uh, lean, mm -hmm. simple. Mm. Um, what do they mean by beautiful? I think the same thing. Mm. I think the same thing. Sometimes people say symmetric, but I don't yeah. think symmetry is really at the root of nature. Uh. The more we learn, the more we discover that there are not real symmetries of nature. All of the things that we thought were symmetries turn out to be approximate symmetries. For example, a symmetry. Your left hand and your right hand 
look like mirror images of each other. They're symmetric. Well, they're mm-hmm. not exactly symmetric. If you're, you know, unless you're different than me, your left <laughs> hand is a little bit bigger or smaller than your right hand or whatever. So that's a broken symmetry. Right. It was thought at one time that elementary particles had the left hand, right hand symmetry. Mm-hmm. That for every particle that uh, looks one way, let's say like your left hand, there's another type of particle which is related to it, mirror image, a mirror image of the same particle. Like uh, an electron and a positron? Not an electron and a positron, a left-handed electron and a right-handed oh, electron. Oh, I see. Right. Are we talking spin? Yes, we're talking oh. spin. Okay. Right. So a electron which moves forward and, and rotates to the right is the mirror image of an electron which moves forward and rotates to the left. And that was thought to be a beautiful symmetry of nature, elegant, symmetric, until it was discovered that nature was not symmetric that way. There were left-handed neutrinos, but no right-handed neutrinos. So it became a beautiful fact of nature that left-right symmetry doesn't exist. What uh, which was more beautiful? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people thought were more beautiful. W- what mattered was that it was not a true symmetry of nature. Um, left-handed and right-handed things are not symmetric with each with each other. As time goes on, we learn more and more that the things that we thought were symmetries are not really symmetries, and um, they're approximate symmetries. Or, or they are what we call redundancies of description. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it. No, it's, they're not symmetries. So that element of beauty, I think, is not really there. Wow. It was in the mind, in the mathematical minds of the physicists who wanted to make their equations beautiful. It wasn't there. Well, that's such an important point that, Physics can be guided by presuppositions, by preferences. Uh, I mean, unity yes. is another one. I mean, I mean, unity is another one. The idea that we have to ultimately unify all the forces uh, and come up with a grand unified theory. Well, who says? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think what uh, what we pretty much all agree on. Well, maybe not even, but to a large extent, that our theories should be consistent. Mm-hmm. They should be consistent, and it is satisfying when a single, when one law explains many things. It's very satisfying to know that, as I said, that um, that Maxwell's equations describe many, many different phenomena. Same with Einstein's equations. Same with any uh, theory of quantum mechanics. The more you describe using the less input the more satisfying it mm-hmm. is. Uh, I suppose you could call that beautiful. Does it have to be that nature at its deepest, deepest roots is simple? No. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I don't know. But this is, what the, this is what makes it exciting, that you don't know what you're going to find. If we knew what we were going to find, it would make it much less interesting. Well, I think in order to keep coming up with great ideas, and you, you've done this throughout your career, you can't get too attached to anything, right? Yeah, that's true. You can't get too attached to anything. There are ideas which I had which I was absolutely certain were true at the time. And as time went on, they looked less and less certain until I and other people became convinced they were wrong. Some people can't let go. Some people can't let go and keep making the same mistake the rest of their lives. Mm. I have to say, I have been good at letting go. You told a, a story. I happen to have been lucky enough to be at a um, an event in honor of a couple of your colleagues, Tom Banks and Willie Fishler. I was there. You were there, That's and you nice. gave a were you really at the banquet. I was at the banquet, <laughs> and you That's gave right. a really interesting tribute to your friend Willie. Yes, you told a story. I think it was when you guys were young physicists and traveling in Europe. Mm-hmm. And he had come up with a very interesting idea. Oh. And you... Oh, 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 the monopole catalysis idea. Yeah, want to tell us that yeah, story? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't in Europe. It was in uh, San Diego. Oh, was it? Okay. It was in San Diego. Yeah. Uh, okay, so 
let me just back up a minute. There are objects which have never been discovered yet, but everybody thinks they will be discovered. Well, either they will be discovered, or if not, it'll just be because the experiments are too hard, called magnetic monopoles. Magnetic monopoles are like the end of the north end of a magnet, but no south end to go with it. All right, so magnetic monopoles. The other thing that comes into it is the decay of protons. Protons are very stable particles. If they weren't stable, you wouldn't be here. Your protons would have evaporated. But it is deeply believed that the proton eventually will evaporate. A proton will eventually evaporate and disappear. Over what time scale? Oh, 10 to the 32 years, which is many, many, many <laughs> times the age of the universe. Mm -hmm. But like many chemical reactions, you can imagine catalyzing them. Catalyzing them means putting them in an environment which will make them happen much faster. So it turned out that, uh, that we now know that putting a proton near a monopole Near a magnetic monopole will catalyze the proton to evaporate. My friend Willie, I think it was sometime around 1980, I don't remember the right time, he was young, much younger than me, and he came and he said, I have this idea. I, I can't quite see the mathematics of how it works, but I really think it must be right. Namely, that, uh, that monopoles would catalyze proton decay. Well, I looked at it and I said, nah, that's wrong. That's wrong. I had some argument. I didn't say it willy-nilly because I didn't like Willie. <laughs> I said it because I thought it was wrong. Mm. But uh, I was very wrong. He was right. I was wrong. Unfortunately, he um, put too much stock in my opinion because he was right. And very shortly after that, I think maybe weeks after that, Two rather famous physicists, one a Russian by the name of Rubikov and another American by the name of Callan, independently realized it. They didn't get it from him. They independently realized it, and it became the famous callan rubikoff effect. And poor Willie was left out of it. Um, but I, I believe I am fairly careful to tell young people, if I tell you something is wrong and you think it's right, Pay no attention to what I say. I don't want to be responsible for another disaster like that. <laughs> you talked him out of a, a significant coup in, in, in the field of physics. And that night I saw you at the banquet, you actually apologized on stage. It was what? well for having, you know, talked him out of it. You oh, said, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've always felt yeah. bad about it. Yeah. yeah. That was that was really in interesting to see. Again, a nice insight into how physics actually works. Yeah. And do you know how many th important things Pauli told Wolfgang Pauli, the great Wolfgang Pauli, told people was crap, and they uh, and they listened to him. Uh, 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 several, yeah, I imagine several, several. I can't remember exactly now. If I thought about it, I'd remember. But there was a whole series of things Pauli told people. He he was an acid kind of guy. He was uh, I don't know if he was a nice man or not, but he uh, and. Uh, yeah, Einstein so told people authority. stuff was wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Einstein was one of those people who got very attached to certain ideas. Yeah. And turned out, at least at this point, we think he was wrong, you know. And yeah, so, no, no, yeah, no. Yeah, he'd be right. Um, Bohr, Bohr had really wrong ideas. Bohr was certainly a very great physicist, no question about it. Bohr thought that energy would not be conserved in nuclear physics. It ha I, th I believe it had to do with the neutrino. You know, neutrinos are particles that are barely detect detectable. So when um, radioactive decays take place, neutrinos fly out, and at the time, neutrinos could not be detected. So the question was, well, what was happening to the energy that we now know was carried off by neutrinos? Mm, mm. Um, Bohr just decided, he reviewed what he knew about energy conservation and came to the conclusion that energy is simply not conserved in nuclear physics. Einstein told him he was wrong, incidentally, but uh, Bohr forced a group of his young colleagues to write a paper on this subject. It was an embarrassing paper. It was wrong. Bohr believed it. Bohr was not being a bad guy. He really deeply, deeply believed it, and he wanted to make these people's career by putting them on a great and famous paper. But it was wrong. Hmm. 
who showed it was wrong? That son of a gun, Pauli. <laughs> Well, we were talking about the fact that, you know, in a way, if you really want to make breakthroughs, treat nothing as sacred. On the other hand, there are some things you hold sacred, right? I mean, yeah, conservation, uh, you, you mentioned conservation of energy, but conservation of information even more is something that even led more. you to uh, have an argument uh, with Stephen Hawking that right. was the subject of your book, The Black Hole War, That's right. and led to a lot of these realizations about black holes and about the holographic principle and so on. Right. By and by. So why is conservation of information, that information can neither be created nor destroyed, it's always preserved in some way? Okay, it's at the root of something which um, I think is extremely deep but very pervasive in physics. It's the second law of thermodynamics. Um, I guess if I hold anything really, really sacred, it's a s sacred. Uh, I'm not sure what I mean by that. I don't, I don't pray to it. Uh, but whenever I see a paper that uh, in one way or another violates the second law of thermodynamics, not the paper does, the, the authors are <laughs> suggesting uh, something which sometimes they don't realize violates the second law of thermodynamics. And, and I think we should jump in and state it concisely, the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy increases. Things get worse. Uh, <laughs> there's a tendency for the world uh, to uh, wind down and become random. Messier. Very, very random. Messy. Messy and random. Okay. Uh, and of course, there's a, there's a mathematical formulation of that, which is very precise. Um, whenever I see anything that looks or smells at all as if it might violate the second law of thermodynamics, I immediately reject it. I even get angry. I, uh, I will be very brutal to whoever it is that suggests it. And they're doing and, this uh, unknowingly, right? Thus far, sometimes un mostly unknowingly, yes, often unknowingly. They write huh. theories that violate the second law. They didn't mean to, and, um, and sometimes it's impossible to explain it to them. But if there's anything that makes me furious, it's that. I, I guess I'm, I'm stunned that people could unknowingly break what is is universally agreed to be a truth, right? A, a physical yep. truth. Yep. How, how do they stumble into that? Well. And by the I, way, if it, if it yeah. were violated, everything else would fall apart, right? Everything I mean, would fall. In everything physics. in physics would <laughs> fall apart. Uh, don't get me wrong. I don't think these people are bad physicists. Not at all. Oh. Look, Stephen Hawking fell into that trap. The question that he asked was an extremely deep one. You could really rephrase it. How, in the context of uh, black holes, can you rescue the physics that goes into the second law? How can you rescue the conservation of information? And uh, Stephen himself fell into the trap of assuming things which in the end would violate the second law. That, that information is lost when things or get least, sucked into yeah. a black hole. Or at least, uh, if uh, not the second law, the conservation of information. Which is so closely related, right, uh, right to the second law. Yeah. They're very closely related to it. But this was deep. I mean, this was, this was not really a mistake. This was an extremely seminal and deep insight and a paradox the examples that I'm thinking about are much less interesting where people really just write down equations which don't make sense. Uh, uh, it happens. Uh, I don't think I've been guilty of that, but I've made mistakes. By the uh, way, the uh, the physicist who came up with the second law of thermodynamics. It was Boltzmann. And what is on his tombstone? Oh, I forget. Uh, you tell me what's on his tombstone. I, it, I, I knew. I think it's the equation for entropy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it must be. Was it P log P? Uh, S equals uh, H equals P log P? P log P, uh, minus P log P. Uh, I'm drawing from ancient memory, but I yeah, think I, I that's remember right. there's something on his tombstone, which is one of the famous uh, equations of thermodynamics, hmm. and I don't remember what which. Boltzmann was driven. I, I don't know if he he did commit suicide. No, I don't know why he committed suicide. Huh. Uh, some people think it's because nobody accepted his uh, theory of the second law of thermodynamics. The truth was everybody accepted it, but I think he may have been a bit of a depressive. 
And I, I was told, not by anybody who knew him, it was too long ago, but I was told by a historian that he uh, may have committed suicide because he was depressed that nobody believed in the atomic theory. In the, uh, in the molecular theory of matter. Now, of course, that wasn't true. Most good scientists, most good physicists did believe in it, but there were a few uh, who were very prominent who didn't. I think if I remember, he committed suicide fairly shortly before Einstein finally put the nail in that, uh, that completely convinced everybody of, uh, of molecular theory of matter. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But who yeah. knows why, uh, why he did. But in any case, the second law is due to Boltzmann, and he took him a long time to get it right, and he finally got it right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think another story is told that it was the, the sheer, you know, sort of depressive consequences of that law that drove him to kill himself. Okay, that's which, another possibility. Which I seriously right. doubt. I seriously doubt. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> No. No. I want to throw at you just a, one random big question, because I think you are such a good explainer that I'd love to have you tackle it. The difference between classical physics and post-classical physics. You uh, mean quantum physics? I do mean okay. quantum physics. Right. In, uh, in your book, The Theoretical Minimum, it says classical is everything preceding quantum physics, including relativity, by the way. Yeah. Even relativity is classical. Mm -hmm. So classical doesn't mean Newtonian. No. So what's the big dividing line between those two domains? Deterministic versus uh, quantum indeterminism. Quantum mechanics, when it raises its head, things become unpredictable. There's a famous quote of Laplace about classical mechanics. He didn't call it classical mechanics. It was physics as far as he knew it. <laughs> and I can't do the quote. The quote is a long uh, paragraph. But it's to the effect that if uh, one could know every single thing about the starting point of uh, about the initial, what we call the initial conditions, the starting point of every molecule, every particle in the universe, if you knew its position and its velocity at the start, and you knew all the laws of forces and so forth, you could predict the world forever and ever and ever by simply solving Newton's equations. This is deterministic physics, deterministic physics that everything is exactly predictable by solving the equations if you know enough to, uh, at the beginning. Um, in quantum mecha mechanics, that's not true. There's uncertainty, there's randomness, there's an element of unpredictability that's inherent. It's not just that you don't know enough. It's not just that you didn't do your homework and collect all the data to begin with. It's that built into nature, there's a fundamental unpredictability, what Einstein called throwing the God throwing the dice. And that's the border. That's, that's, the, that's the line of um, demarcation between classical physics and quantum mechanics. Now, of course, even in classical physics, if you don't know everything to begin with, we don't know the position of every molecule and every atom. And because of that, there's a, a degree of unpredictability in what the weather is going to be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But that's not thought to be fundamental in the same way. That's thought to be due to the imprecision of our ability to measure things that in principle we could measure better. Right. So in principle, there's no obstruction, no fundamental obstruction to being able to specify the exact position or the almost exact position of every single molecule. And in classical physics, that would allow you to, let's say, predict the weather. Mm -hmm. um, in quantum mechanics, no matter how much you know about a system, you cannot predict. Right. So, And yet quantum physics is very exact. So, so it has a very exact description of those unpredictable phenomena. That's right. It has an exact, but it's a, it's a probabilistic description. Right. To give, to give you an example of something which is exact but statistical, or if you flip a coin and it's a good, fair coin, you can say with some exactness that if you flip it enough times, you will get half heads, half tails within the margin of error, where the margin of error means a very specific thing. And the more times you flip it, the closer you will get. The more times you get. flip it, the closer you will get to 50% heads, 50% tails. Right. 
Uh, that's a statistical fact that uh, that we believe is true. We rely on it all the time. It has a certain exactness to it, but still it's talking about things which are not predictable. Quantum mechanics is, if you like, a calculus of probabilities. A calculus means a tool for calculating. A tool for calculating probabilities, which if you do the same thing over and over enough times, the probabilities have a very precise meaning. So, for example, if you're doing particle physics, you have uh, some very, very large number of particles coming out of your accelerator. They're all going to do the same thing. They're going to hit some other particle. Some of them will go off this way. Some of them will go off that way. Unpredictable which way any given particle will go off. But the probabilities and the statistics of it is very, very precise. So with 10 to the 13th particles, what's that, uh, 10, 10 trillion particles, you can predict with great precision um, what percentage of them will go to the left, what percentage of them will fly off to the right. Mm -hmm. And that's what quantum mechanics does. Right. What for you is the biggest mystery at this point? Oh, at any given time, it's what I'm focused on and what's confusing me. And it could be a little thing. So right now, uh, what keeps you awake at night? What keeps me awake uh, uh, is black holes. There were some very fascinating and interesting arguments made by a group in Santa Barbara, including my friend Joe Polchinski, who was a very famous physicist, who are questioning much of what we thought we knew about black holes. Nobody, including them, thinks that they're right, incidentally. Ah. But it's one of these situations where they have an argument which looks impregnable. It looks clearly um, logically precise. And it seems to say that the horizons of the black holes, after the black holes get very old, after a long, long period of time, the horizons of black holes become impenetrable. That uh, it's the firewall argument. It's called the firewall. Um, that black holes age. Not by not just evaporating, but worse things happen to them, and the horizons of them become bad um, holograms. The film making the hologram degrades, according to this line of argument, and uh, the structure of black holes, or particularly for people falling into black holes, would be much more dangerous than we thought. This violates everything about classical general relativity that we knew. My guess is it's wrong. My friend Joe Polchinski, who was one of the uh, pioneers in this mistake, uh, also thinks it's wrong. <laughs> he's, he's hoping someone will prove him wrong. Yes, he is. Yeah. Yes, he is. Uh -huh. Because he thinks we will learn something deep from wow. it, and I think he's right. But yes, this keeps me awake. Because if, on the off chance, he is right, these results are right... What goes by the wayside? Um, nothing for young black holes, probably. <laughs> young black holes, incidentally, we're talking about if it was a solar mass black hole, I think it's 10 to 72 years, oh. many, many, many <laughs> times the age of the universe. But uh, but black holes which have evaporated an appreciable fraction right. of, their, of, their, of their mass. Yeah. And while it has no practical consequences, even for ordinary black holes out there, it has deep consequences for the relation between quantum mechanics and gravity again. If it's right, I'm not sure what goes. I'm not sure what goes. That's what's so troubling about it is we don't understand what its consequences would be. Now, do I think they're right? No, I don't think they're right. But, um, but nobody knows what's wrong with their argument. Boy, never a dull moment though, right? Never a dull moment, yeah. And uh, that's the... That's the pattern, surprises. This is why when people ask, you know, what's physics going to be like in 50 years or is the anthropic principle going to be right or whatever, you make your best guess about it, but you should keep in the back of your mind that the pattern is always the same, that there's going to be a number of surprises. The surprises are, in by their very nature, surprising, and uh, you're going to be wrong about some fraction and there's no way to predict which fraction it will be. 
So that makes it frustrating. It makes it exciting. It makes it fun. And, uh, and uh, as you say, it keeps you up at night sometimes. Well, on the one hand, the, the, the dream, supposedly, of physicists is to solve all the problems. But wouldn't that be sad? Well, I always say, yeah, no, I always, I always say my, my goal is to try to uh, solve the final remaining problem of physics 15 seconds before I die. Because if it happens much before 15 seconds, I'm going to be a very bored old man. What am I going to do if we do solve all the, all the problems? So, yeah. So the only thing worse than not solving all the problems is solving all the problems. <laughs> Does knowing as much as you know about the universe compared to, say, the average person? Well, I know certain, I, I know certain things about the universe. Do you feel that when you're walking around? Do you think, no. I know this, no, I no, know this no, world? No, no. I do not walk around and look at the world and, uh, and uh, <laughs> say, here I am a tiny, tiny, insignificant <laughs> speck in an enormous <laughs> multiverse. No, no, I don't. <laughs> I, I do the same thing you do. I watch, make sure I don't trip over my feet. I look at the sunshine because it's because uh, it's warm and it's pleasant. Well, thank you so much. I really feel like you know that you do us a great service um, when you share what you do know no. with the rest of us. It's fun, fun. It's certainly fun for me. Okay, thank Thanks. you so much. You're welcome. Leonard Suskind is the Felix Bloch Professor of Theoretical Physics at Stanford University, and he directs the Stanford Institute for Theoretical Physics. This has been the 7th Avenue Project. I'm Robert Pauly signing off. I'll be back next week. You can always visit us online at 7thAvenueProject.com.